re-recording of the talk I gave at the University of Missouri on the 13th of September. I want to thank Karthik for inviting me to participate in this Evolution in the Social Sciences lecture series. And my topic, as you can see, is what explains the immense variability in homicide rates across time and space. So the thing I want to do first is to illustrate what I mean by the word immense variability. Here are some homicide rates across countries in the most recent year for which the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime happened to have a set of data when I assembled this. Um, this is a non-systematic selection of countries just to illustrate the magnitude and variability. One thing worth noting here is that I have expressed homicide rates per million persons per annum. Homicide rates are more commonly expressed per 100,000 people per annum, so you may have been startled to see, for example, the U.S. homicide rate in double digits rather than single digits, but these, it's going to be per million persons throughout this, just so places like Japan with lower homicide rates, you don't have to use decimal places to illustrate their homicide rates. And as you can see, there's a big range. And my question is, what explains this kind of variability? Well, people have tried a lot of things. The sort of sociological, criminological tradition is to correlate everything you can think of with homicide rates and see what accounts for the most variance. And the answer is usually, almost always, income inequality. So what you see here is an illustration of the scatter plot and the correlation between homicide rate on the y-axis in a log scale, you may note, and income inequality on the horizontal axis, the x-axis. And in this case now, this is an exhaustive list of all the countries for which these kind of data were available. Um, the most common index of income inequality, and the one that I'll use for almost all of this talk, is the Gini index, so-called. Gini is not an acronym, it's the name of an Italian economist who invented this index, and I think it's worth explaining what it is, because you see it all the time in discussions of income inequality. So I'll illustrate what the Gini index is. Supposing you have a set of income units, whether they're individual earners, they're commonly households in economics, and you array them ordinarily from the lowest income to the highest income along the x-axis at equal intervals. And then you plot the cumulative proportion of total income against that equal interval unit. And if everybody had, had exactly the same income, then the cumulative proportion will lie on what I've called the line of equal income here. But of course, typically, real income distributions aren't like that. They, a number of people have very low incomes, a number of people have high incomes, and so you start off, if you're accumulating from the lowest, with not much of a gain in the um, cumulative curve initially, and then it rises acceleratingly as you have more and more higher income earners to produce something like this Lorentz curve of cumulative income. And Lorentz is just another economist. So what the Gini index is, is the area between the line of equal income and the Lorentz curve divided by the total area under the line of equal income. And if incomes are quite equitable, then the Lorentz curve will be close to the line of equal income. And if they're completely equitable, this Gini index will approach zero. If they're drastically inequitable, so that almost nobody has any income at all and the curve is staying very, very low almost until the end, then the Gini index will approach one. So it's an index between zero and one, indicative of income inequality. And one thing that's nice about it is, is in principle at least, orthogonal to the actual magnitude of incomes. You can compute a Gini index where, you know, in a place where everybody's poor, things are nevertheless equitable. A place where everybody's rich, things are nevertheless equitable. And conversely, poor or rich, things can be highly inequitable. So back to this slide that you saw a moment ago. Here is this distribution of homicide rates plotted against um, income inequality, a household-based Gini is sort of standard economists measure. 
and it's for every country for which you've got the relevant data. And having the relevant data means that you have to have a respectable income survey that would enable you to compute the distribution of incomes. And there's going to be sources of major noise in here. I mean, for one thing, in the quality of the income surveys is going to be highly variable. Nevertheless, um, you get a pretty good relationship between these two variables. And for the Americans among you, you may have noted that the USA looks like a kind of middle of the pack country in this figure. You look a little more closely, you see that it is above the median in both income inequality and homicide rate, but nevertheless, kind of in the middle of the pack. However, that picture changes if you compare it to other countries that are more comparable with respect to their wealth and development. And in particular, there's 22 countries, I think, that the UN classifies as having fully developed economies. And this is a subset of the data you just saw just for those developed economy countries. And what you can see is that the US now has the worst income inequality of any of them and second worst homicide rate to Lithuania, who has the worst homicide rate and the second worst inequality. And you'll notice too, perhaps, that all those Baltic countries, those former Soviet republics, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, are all way up there too. But the correlation is still strong, and even within these developed countries. When you think about it for a minute, it may have occurred to you too that a country may not be the scale at which a variable like income inequality might be most relevant. And indeed, it's been looked at at other scales. And within the US, if we use state level income inequality to predict homicide rates or to correlate with homicide rates, we see something like this, or we see exactly this for the year 2015, the most recent year for which I could find these data. I've included Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia here, both of which have exceptional homicide rates and exceptional income inequality. If you left them out, the correlation would still be strong and significant. And as you can see, income inequality is a good predictor of homicide rates at the US state level as well. And indeed, nobody's ever found a better one, a better single predictor. A number of years ago, my colleagues and I conducted some analyses on US data and Canadian data and published this figure based on 1990 data the 50 US states in red and the 10 Canadian provinces in green. And there's something pretty striking here. The two sets of points seem to lie roughly on the same trajectory. That is to say, Canada has a much lower homicide rate, but it also has much lower income inequality. And the worst Canadian provinces in terms of income inequality and homicide look a lot like the best US states in terms of income inequality and homicide. We thought this was particularly remarkable because it seems to imply that income inequality can pretty much account for the differences in overall homicide rates between these two neighboring countries, which have been the object of a great deal of discussion. This idea that income inequality is an important variable in predicting and perhaps explaining variable homicide rates has been kicking around for longer than this. And I think pretty much the first um, use of it that I'm aware of was in this work by a couple of American sociologists, Judith and Peter Blau. And what they were engaged in was comparing across cities in the United States. They got a bunch of different kinds of measures from the 125 largest US cities, or rather US standard metropolitan census areas, and did a number of analyses predicting homicide and other crimes. Homicide is the best measured crime, the one um, that all criminologists, I think, agree is most reliably recorded. And so in some ways, it's the best index of crime generally. But we're talking about any homicide here, and I'll just talk about the results for homicide. Main result, first of all, was income inequality. The first time it was used in this kind of analysis was the single best predictor of homicide. Second major result 
which I think is an interesting one that's been largely neglected in subsequent literature, was this, that if you partitioned inequality into the overall inequality of the household Gini level, inequality measure that I've talked about you, and the inequality between blacks and whites, just the difference between black and white average incomes, these prove to be distinct additive predictors and actually have roughly equal impact. And this hasn't been followed up in subsequent literature. It hasn't really been paid much attention to since, but it certainly deserves to be. Finally, I'll mention one more result, which is that if you added the percent of the population of the city that was below the poverty line, the national poverty line, this added no additional prediction. And I think this is worth mentioning because there's been some controversy about whether income inequality or poverty is the more important factor. And of course, where income inequality is high, poverty tends also to be high, at least across states or cities in the U.S. But income inequality is the variable that seems to really matter in this analysis and arguably in analyses generally. Now, why? Why is income inequality a good predictor of homicide? Well, if any of you have heard me talk before, then you know my slant on this. Homicide rates reflect the intensity of male competition. And I'll just illustrate that by pointing out that most homicides occur in a context of competition between young men. Material competition, like robberies and drug trade wars, is pretty straightforward. But I would also stress that the more mundane kinds of chest bumping contests that young men get into that sometimes end up with somebody dead, status challenges, somebody disrespecting somebody, are a kind of competition too, social competition for limited social resources. And actually these social competition, status challenge kinds of cases, account for about half of all homicides in the United States. Not only are men killing unrelated male rivals the majority of all homicides, but they're also the most variable component of homicide rates, both across states in the U.S. and across countries. So where homicide rates are high, these are a very high proportion of all homicides. When homicide rates are low, then they've fallen away and you're left with the spousal homicides and things like that. And so if these are the most variable component of homicide rates, this is where the action is if you're trying to explain the variability in homicide rates. And to elaborate, my argument is that homicide rates reflect the intensity of male competition. Homicide rates are primarily, homicidal conflicts rather, are primarily competitive conflicts. And economic inequality is kind of an index of, as well as a component of, the intensity of competition, of what competition is all about. So more intense competition warrants more extreme competitive tactics, and this can escalate to potentially lethal competitive tactics. And this is an argument that I've elaborated at length in a book, this book, Killing the Competition, published a few years ago, which I actually wrote during my time at the University of Missouri. But Inequality isn't everything, even where it counts for a high proportion of the variance in homicides, there's still another proportion to be seen. And that's mostly what I want to address in the rest of this talk, is what else matters. So we'll start with a meta-analysis published 10 years ago by this person, this British criminologist, Amy Nivet. And although she titled her paper Cross-National Predictors of Crime, she was actually solely concerned with homicide. I'm not quite sure why she called it crime. But Amy Nevet meta-analyzed various cross-national studies that were available in the literature. They're not huge studies because they're often ones where people could only find the measures they were interested in for a subset of countries. So I don't think any of her the studies she included in her analysis had more than about 40 countries, and some had as few as 11. But here's her results. Number one, income inequality is your best predictor again. The second best predictor, and now by best predictors, I'm talking about turning up regularly in the different studies that included them, and also just the meta-analysis's um, indicator of the strength of the association, the quality of the predictor. Number two was something called a decommodification index. And if you're not a political economist, you probably never heard of this. 
it's described by the people who use it as an index of the extent to which labor is decommodified, by which they mean people can lead a happy and reasonably prosperous life without having to sell their labor as a commodity. But the way Nevet characterizes it, when you look at the components that are put into it, is the social safety net. And so in a sense, the decommodification index is catch, capturing what's the components of inequality that are not captured by income inequality. So this too is economic inequality, the two together, if you like, um, index economic inequality and the, the number one and number two predictors. But there were others. All of these came out as significant predictors. Divorce rate, population growth rate, or age structure. I mean, there's there's sort of the same thing because when the population is growing, the proportion of the population that's young tends to be high. Ethnic heterogeneity, homogeneous countries um, tend to have lower homicide rates, and female labor force participation. At least according to Nevet's meta-analysis, a number of things which people have claimed are important didn't really come out um, as robustly relevant. Population density, urbanization, sex ratio, democracy, unemployment rate. Uh, none of these shook out in Nevet's analysis. But as I mentioned, Nevet's analysis even is of national level data from countries that keep statistics are organized in certain ways, and you're still missing some things. I think the most important thing you're missing in this kind of analysis is access to impartial, enforceable dispute resolution. Because in the absence of judicial institutions and in the absence of law enforcement, then people have to resort to self-help justice. They have to carry weapons. They have to be prepared to respond with violence to affronts if necessary. And this is true even in highly egalitarian tribal societies. It's been considered something of a mystery why so-called egalitarian societies nevertheless have high homicide rates. Arguably, this is the answer because everybody has to be their own enforcer when there are disputes and there's no trustworthy third-party justice. So, for example, in homicide, homicide rates are very high among hunter-gatherers in general. In this review by Kim Hill and collaborators, the lowest estimate for a hunter-gatherer society they were able to come up with was 300 cases, 300 deaths per million persons per annum, which is about the homicide rate in the worst urban American ghettos. Remarkably high when you think of the Kalahari Sun as having been characterized as uh, a society, well, as the gentle people, as a society with very little violence and highly egalitarian. Homicide rates are high among hunter-gatherers. They're even higher among so-called acephalous tribal, tribal horticulturalists. And what the word acephalous means here, headless, is tribal horticultural societies where there's no chiefs over a larger polity and also where there's no inheritable chiefdom. There may be things like village headmen, but a village headman can roll over um, in terms of basically the willingness of the other village members to have this person be the headman. And in these reviews, the Walker and Bailey review, mainly for um, South America, where there are many of these kinds of societies, the Noft review, Noft's worked in New, New Guinea, the other place where there's many of these kinds of societies, although they're also scattered across much of South Asia. Homicide rates tend to be even higher than among hunter-gatherers, and very high indeed. But this doesn't just matter in these kinds of societies. It matters more widely, too. How egalitarian are these societies anyway? Um, you know, they're called egalitarian, but they're not monetary societies. You're not going to measure wealth in a standard way and show inequality. You look at ethnographies and you think, see things like this, that a particular Yanomamo village headman, um, I can't pronounce his name, but it's the same guy that's sometimes referred to as Shinbone, 
had 43 children and 231 grandchildren. If one man is having that much of a reproductive cascade, other men are losing out. And so arguably the most important currency, the fundamental currency, the one that in some sense money is a proxy for or a means to the end of, namely reproductive success, is actually highly inequitable in some so-called egalitarian societies. And across tribal societies, lethal violence is correlated with the degree of polygyny, the degree to which some men monopolize more than one wife. Frank Marlowe showed this in a review um, and cross-cultural comparison across hunter-gatherer societies. Joe Hemrich et al. have extended that kind of analysis to incorporate some of these acephalous tribal horticulturalists. And the degree of polygyny, which is often measured like what proportion of married women, which essentially means all adult women in these societies, what proportion of married women are married to a man who has other wives, is one way people measure this. But there are more precise ways in principle that it could be measured. So inequality matters even in these so-called egalitarian societies. But that doesn't mean that access to impartial, enforceable dispute resolution isn't also an additional consideration besides inequality that's important. And as I said before, getting ahead of myself a little, it's not just in tribal societies that this matters. It also matters in societies in which there is law and policing and judiciary, but access isn't universal. And in the case of the U.S., what springs to mind is both frontiers and urban underclasses. And I commend this book, Violent Land, by the uh, Florida historian David Cartwright. To anybody interested in this topic, Cartwright makes a strong case, I think, that the absence of impartial enforceable dispute resolution puts men on frontiers and men in urban underclasses in very much the same situation as men in tribal society, where they have to be their own enforcers and high rates of violence follow. And this issue of access to dispute resolution and law is partly the issue of the regular and fair application of law. So if there is impunity, if law is not reliable, if punishment does not occur reliably, then this is also a factor that can produce homicide in nations, high homicide rates in nation states. And this is a point that's been made especially for the case of Brazil, who I'll talk about briefly, illustrate the problem of impunity in Brazil with these numbers. As you can see, in this six-year period, there were 320, over 328,000 homicides in the country of Brazil. But at the end of that period, there was only a quarter as many as that prisoners actually serving time in prison for having killed anybody implying that there's a very high level of impunity, that there's a big impunity problem in Brazil. Well, the Brazilian epidemiologist Paulo Nadinovsky has done some analyses showing that impunity predicts homicide rates across states within Brazil. And the way Paulo has tried to operationalize impunity is just by some sort of index of the relative numbers of people in prison to violent crime rates. And where violence crime is punished less, then homicide rates are higher across states within Brazil. And in other analyses, in another pub paper published in the same year, Paulo and a collaborator have also shown that impunity predicts homicide rates across countries too, both in comparisons within Latin America and more broadly. So if the state isn't working to detect and punish homicide, then it's not deter de deterring homicide. And this is related to the next issue I want, or the next variable I want to talk about that's been claimed to be important in driving homicide rates, and that is the legitimacy of governments and institutions. And this is an argument that has been pushed especially by American historian Randolph Roth in this book, which again I recommend to people, called American Homicide. And Roth argues that there are four correlates of homicide rate changes in U.S. history. 
They're all so-called variables expressed in rather lengthy phrasing. And I would suggest that all four of them reduce to something like respect for the government and respect for the social order. And um, he uses the term legitimacy of governments and institutions. How do you measure it? How do you measure legitimacy? Well, there's variable ways that people have tried. Roth, as an historian and making his case, fishes around for indices in the historical record. And one that he used that I particularly liked, it's not by no means the only thing he used in making this argument, is this one, the proportion of new counties named for national heroes. In a particular jurisdiction, in a particular time, when they establish new counties, if they name them for national heroes, he takes that as an index of respect for the government. Um, and if they name them for something else, as less so, and shows that this actually is related in some analyses to homicide rates. Other people have done other things. An obvious one is a more or less direct survey question, as illustrated by this paper. Um, the trouble with this one is that you tend to get a lot of partisanship affecting um, the answers to this. If you're a Democrat and there's a Republican in the White House, you say the government's less legitimate and vice versa. And, you know, if you're a Republican, vice versa. Um, still, apparently, this is um, to some degree a predictor of violent crime rates. The size of the so-called shadow economy is an interesting measure, the untaxed economy. And so in a sense, this is a measure of the reach of governments, the extent to which they've really got governance under control, and hence a kind of measure of the legitimacy of governments, perhaps also a kind of measure of the need for um, self-help justice. And this is also a predictor. And then Amy Nevet and Manuel Eisner, in a paper published a couple of years after the uh, the um, meta-analysis that I talked about before, created a compound index of government legitimacy based on some attitude surveys like world's value surveys, answers, and some governmental and citizen action, and, uh, and showed that this too is a predictor of homicide rates. So something like government legitimacy seems to be in the mix here. And this idea of legitimacy has actually been kicking around in the criminological literature for longer. It was introduced 10 years before Roth by Gary LaFree, an American criminologist, in this book, Losing Legitimacy, Street Crime and the Decline of Social Institutions in America. And LaFree made the argument that, well, I've quoted from him here, when members of a society begin to doubt the fairness of legal and political institutions, they become less enthusiastic supporters of the laws and rules that they promulgate. And formal punishment by the legal system becomes less threatening and carries less of a stigma. And you'll notice that he began by saying, begin to doubt the fairness. I think this is very largely about perceived fairness of governments and institutions. And what does fairness mean? Fairness means something like equitable treatment, equal opportunity, universality of access to legal remedies when you've been wronged. And so again, we're back talking about equality and inequality. And we're also talking about trust. Legitimacy is also about trust, the trust in the government, the trust in one's fellow citizens. And my favorite demonstration of the relevance of trust or the possible relevance of tr trust to income inequality or vice versa, is a study in which um, some Harvard epidemiologists led by Ichiro Kawachi showed that there's a strong association between agreement with this statement in a survey. Most people would try to take advantage of you if you got the chance and income inequality, if they got the chance and income inequality, ranging from under 10% agreement in North Dakota to over 40% in Louisiana, a very strong association. And this is the only place in this talk where I've used an index other than the Gini index, the so-called Robin Hood index. It's not used often, but it is used by this group of Harvard epidemiologists, including in some homicide analyses. 
So I think it's worth explaining briefly. It's a cute name because it means how much would you have to take from the rich and give to the poor in order to equilibrate things. And you saw this figure about the Gini index earlier. Well, the Robin Hood index is just the maximum vertical deviation of that Lorentz curve from the equal income line. So the more unequal and the farther the Lorentz curve gets from the equal income line, the bigger the Robin Hood index. And so it's obviously closely related to the Gini, and in fact, it's correlated with the Gini at like 0.99 across US states. So they might as well have used Gini in the figure you just saw. So far, everything I've said has been about what explains the immense variability in homicide rates across space and not across time. It's all been about so-called cross-sectional variability. That is to say, variability between units like countries or states at a slice in time. But what about changes over time? And if anybody's drawing a deep breath and about to log off because, oh my God, now comes the second half, I'm only going to show you one figure related to this before we move to the wrap up. And that is this. Here is the volatility of homicides per million persons per annum in the USA over a 60 year period. And as you can see, it's jumped around a lot, a slightly more than twofold from the lowest value portrayed here to the highest. And the reason I go back to 1960 only is because there are various reasons to think before that the measures are a little bit um, less reliable. But it certainly bounced around like this before as well. Around 1930, the homicide rate was up around 100, like it got back to again in 1980. Around 1900, it was lower than at any point on this curve. So homicide rates have bounced up and down and up and down. Why? Income inequality doesn't look like a very good predictor of this. It doesn't track income inequality changes in the short term, certainly. So, for example, in the 1990s, the homicide rates falling steeply, while income inequality was nevertheless rising in the U.S. Some people think that kills the argument for income inequality being of direct relevance. I don't buy it because income inequality isn't expected to affect homicide rates simultaneously. I mean, how the hell does it affect homicide rates? Guys don't decide whether to carry a weapon in response to reading what this year's Gini index is. They're responding to a lifetime of experience that tells them about inequitable opportunity and so forth. And so you'd expect the effects of homicide rates, of inequality rather on homicide rates, to be lagged to some degree. But what does explain this kind of variability? I mean, it's not a simple lag measure of inequality either. And there's been a lot of ideas floated around, and some of them seem to have some validity for some places and some times. Um, but most of them are bunk. I mean, bunk like when Rudy Giuliani was mayor of New York, he tried to claim credit for the declining homicide rate in New York um, due to his innovations and policing actions. The trouble with that is he was already in the midst of a nationwide decline in homicide rates when he became mayor, and homicides fell in the same period while he was mayor more in cities like Boston than they did in New York. But some of the arguments are a little better than that and work locally, but they don't work um, when you extend them to other places or other times. And I think it's fair to say that the general state of our understanding of this question is portrayed in the next slide. What explains changes over time? Answer, who knows? I don't think we've made much headway with that one yet. So what can we say in sum? What explains the immense variability in homicide rates across time, perhaps, and certainly space? We've got this group of variables, income inequality, racial disparities, inequality of opportunity, the social safety net, which arguably is a further contributor to economic inequality. Some studies suggest absolute poverty. I put absolute in quotes because income inequality is sometimes called relative poverty. Some people suggest these things all matter, um, that we've got that group of variables that seem to be highly relevant. We've got another group of variables like population age structure, population density, maybe sex ratio, maybe ethnic heterogeneity seems to come out clearly, population structure variables that also seem to matter. Then we've got 
these variables in small scale societies and arguably in large scale societies as well. Monogamy versus polygamy, the extent to which some men are monopolizing more women than others. And marital stability, the relevance of divorce rates may have to do with the same thing. We've got impunity, policing, judicial even-handedness, that group of variables. We've got legitimacy of government, social cohesion, trust. We've got the demand for legal goods, the size of the shadow economy. We've got a couple of things I haven't mentioned at all. Life expectancy has been shown to be a good predictor at sometimes relatively fine scales like neighborhood level in some studies. And I mentioned emergency medicine here because, of course, the quality and availability of emergency medicine is going to affect whether a certain wound turns into a homicide or not. And then we've got this little variable landing with a thunk, gun availability, which hasn't been shown to be an important variable in almost any empirical analysis, and yet it's hard to doubt that it has something to do with the problems at hand, too. So far, the strategy in the analysis of what explains the variability in homicides has been to run analyses in which a bunch of these variables are thrown in as predictor variables. Very little has been done in the way of further sort of structural equation modeling or modeling that asks about the relationships about these variables, about what mediates what. These variables have a lot to do with each other, and it's time for some more sophisticated and careful and thoughtful modeling effort that has feedback loops between these things, that introduces temporal lags, that introduces bi-directional influences among these things, and then their impacts upon homicide. That's where we need to go if we're going to get further in answering this kind of question. And with that, I want to thank you all for your attention, wherever and whenever you are.